Let's go to, I'm like Barney Fife, I got my one bullet here and I don't remember where I put it. Let's see here. You know what I used to do every now and then? I'd put on my suit jacket sometimes and get ready to go to church and I'd reach in my suit jacket and find a wrapped up fork, spoon, and butter knife wrapped in a paper towel. And it came from a church dinner that we would have had where I would grab the silverware bundle, put it in my jacket pocket like that, and go sit down and forget about it and get up and go get some fork and spoon and butter knife and eat with it, dirty it up. Think nothing of it. And the next time I put that jacket on, I'd go, there's a fork in there. Uh, what I like better than that's finding money. Uh, Boy, I had it. Where did I do with it? Y'all don't know, do you? Let's see. No, that's tissue. Hang on a second. Where did I put it? Talk amongst yourselves. Found it! That's enough talking. Turn to Revelation 17. Revelation 17. You believe the Bible tonight? Yeah. You should. This Bible's got everything in it. Everything pertaining to life. Everything pertaining... You've heard me say this before. <clears throat> I think that the Bible is an absolutely perfect blueprint for all of God's creation. Okay? And I love seeing the types and the symbols and the stories in there. When it thunders, that is God's voice. Revelation chapter 4. Um, some said it thundered when God said, This is my beloved son. Some said it thundered. The Lord, you read in this book of Psalms, the Lord thundered on them. Okay, he sent out lightnings. That's his word, amen. Um, but anyway, I believe that this Bible has everything in it that pertains to this world and it gives us a glimpse of the next one. Okay? And it tells us the life that we live. God chose this life for us. Amen? What we wanted was forgiveness of sins. That's why we came to the cross. We wanted forgiveness of sin. We did want a better way. We just, at the time, didn't know much about how much better it is. But that's what we wanted. And, and God loved us so much that He gave us everything that we need in this life right here in this one book. Okay? This is your instruction manual for life. Read it. These things will be applied to you. Revelation 17, there is a very evil, wicked spirit. What's interesting to me is the, um, the anagram, the letters for the Muslim terrorist group is ISIS. That's not is is. That is ISIS. And... I think by way of etymology, which is where the words come from, when God created uh, man and woman in the Garden of Eden, the Hebrew word for woman is Isha. And I think after the Tower of Babel, that word Isha for woman got translated to Isis, which is the name of who? The, yeah, Mystery Babylon. It was the, the, the fertility deity of Egypt. Okay? Isis is married to Osiris. Isis is the moon or the earth, and Osiris is the sun god. And the idea is that those two mate and bring the fertility of the earth. Okay? That's how corrupt they've made the knowledge of God. That's what they've turned it into. Okay? But anyway, Isis represents that woman. And if you think about this, the terrorists in, in Islam are after two groups of people. 
Jews and Western Christians, primarily. Okay? Now, they'll settle for Europeans every now and then. But their hatred is toward Israel and the United States of America because of what this country used to represent, the Word of God. Okay? And so, mark it down. They, they call it ISIS for a reason. And that just that strikes in me every time I hear it. And I want our president to go after ISIS. Amen? That's what I want. I wanted the other president to do it. And he wouldn't touch him. I wanted the president before him to do it. And he kept backing off. Okay? I want it done. The only way to win a battle is to finish it. Make, make sure it's done. And we're not there yet. Revelation 17. There came out of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk, with the wine of her fornication. Beer, whiskey, alcoholic beverages of any kind are of a spirit. And that spirit is her. Mystery Babylon the Great. She makes men drunk. She makes them not sober. Amen? Not sober. Who in here remembers when you were not sober? Amen. Okay? When you were not sober... You did stupid stuff with stupid people at stupid times, stupidly. Amen? Whereas when you are drunk, you're going, did I do that? I don't remember that. Okay? Um, hang on, I got, I got a prayer request. from. No, it's not being transmitted to my brain. Um, who, oh, Bonnie called today. And she wants us to pray for a neighbor of theirs. His wife found him passed out drunk in the garage. And it's coming out now that he's been a drunk now for 20 some odd years. And uh, there, I, from what I gathered, Bonnie, you correct me if I'm wrong, but apparently they're not saved. And um, th that whole couple, that family needs Jesus. Amen? So you pray for that man. Mystery Babylon is his goddess. And she will keep him drunk. As drunk as he wants, she'll keep him drunk. Okay? So anyway, verse um, 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of eyes of blas full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This woman is sitting on that beast. When you sit on the beast, who's in charge? The person sitting on the beast. Okay? She is controlling him. Think Jezebel and Ahab. Okay? Think that. Think um, Herodias and King Herod. She is the one that demanded John the Baptist's head be placed on a charger. She sent her teenage daughter out to be lewd and lascivious to her husband, mind you. Her second husband. Her first husband was Herod's brother. And it's unlawful for Herod to steal Herod's brother's wife from him. And he stole his own brother's wife. And John the Baptist nailed him for it. He said, you know, according to law, Herod, Herod was a Jew, it's illegal for you to have your brother's wife. It's an abomination. And so Herodias said, I'll kill him if it's the last thing I do. And that's what she did. She made her teenage daughter dance lasciviously in front of her own husband to get him high in his mind and he said to her whatever you want I'll give it to you she went running back to mama mama said tell him you want John the Baptist's head on a charger on a plate and the king grieved at it but he did it okay that's that kind of spirit she's controlling who she's riding she wants to be in charge the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication and upon her forehead was a name written, 13 words, mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. 13 words. Jericho is a type of that. 13 times they circled Jericho. Many other things in the Bible are a picture of this. But here's where we're going. Verse 6. 
And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of who? The saints. Listen. Church people have been being killed for thousands of years now. God's people are being murdered and massacred. For Why did this man go into this particular building? What, was his, what did he have in mind? He wasn't just looking for any open building. He went to a church building. The spirit that was in him led him to a church building to kill half of the people. He would have killed everybody in that church. His, the only time he stopped was to pull one magazine out and put another magazine in. That's the only time he stopped. So however fast he could change that magazine, out of, that clip, out of his gun, that's how, that's how long he stopped for. Okay? He's, his, his mother, the spiritual mother, Mystery of Babylon, sent him in to murder and massacre and spill the blood of the saints of the Most High God. She drinks it. She is a blood-thirsty whore. Amen? That's who she is. That's her spirit. And uh, where were we? Revelation set the wind. The, this powerful wind in here blew my page loose. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery. Now notice this. Verse 5, her name is mystery. Which means she conceals things. She's the mastermind of covering up. Whatever they're doing, she puts it in them to cover it up. You don't want her spirit in your head telling you to cover your own sins. What you want is God's spirit in your heart telling you that God will cover your sins. Amen. Amen. So, she's a mystery in verse 5, but John is promised that this angel will tell John the mystery. Why is her name mystery? Why is it a secret? What is she hiding? The angel said, John, I'm going to tell you, that, I'm going to tell you what she's hiding. I'm going to tell you who she is. So anyway, I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Now look at um, verse 11. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. What is it that also numbers ten in the Bible? Ten commandments. Now watch this. These kings are latched to the meaning of those ten commandments because God said to Israel, I've given you my laws, my statutes, my judgments, yea, even ten commandments. I've given them into your hands. Keep them. And if you don't, if you do not keep them, I will unleash upon you your punishment. That's in Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26. You can read Ezekiel, Ezekiel 14 for it, I believe. Yeah. Ezekiel uh, 14, where God describes his four sore judgments against Israel because they threw away God's law. They were not going to keep God's law. They were worshiping Baal. They were serving Ashtaroth. And God said, I'm going to, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were among you, I would save them and get the rest of you. Okay? And this woman is bloodthirsty for that blood, for the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs. And here we have ten kings which, according to verse 12, which have received no kingdom as yet. Don't look in history for who these ten kings are. They've never had a kingdom. But they're going to. Okay? They represent God's wrath poured out upon earth for disobeying and casting away the Ten Commandments. So when a judge has to risk going to jail for having a copy of the Ten Commandments in his courtroom. That was her. And that's these ten kings. Okay? Now watch this. And by the way, I like this. Here you have the ten kings. They represent the law. Law's good. Amen? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And all those things. There's ten of them. And these kings represent the, the punishment for that. 
The law, then, is contrary to grace. The law is good, but we can't keep it. So grace is sufficient where grace can do what the law cannot do. That's grace, okay? When the cop pulls you over and you were doing 85 and a 25, it can be done. And he comes up to you and you respect him and respect his authority and he likes you and he does not smell the smell of alcohol and or marijuana coming out of your car. He knows he caught you just kind of off guard. You're in a hurry for something. He can use discretion and have mercy on you and not give you a punishment for what you did. See, that's the war. The law is contrary to grace. So he said, where am I going here? Revelation 17. Uh, verse 13, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These, verse 14, now look at this. These shall make war with who? The lamb. And the lamb shall overcome. Woo! Now stop right there. Hold that, hold that verse right there. Turn back now. Revelation 13. God finally gave it to me just now. The answer to what I was preaching this morning. Look at this. I ju it, it just clicked in my head just now. Okay? It says, verse, uh, Revelation 13, 7, uh, ver verse 13, 6, He opened His mouth and blasphemed me against God to blaspheme His name and His tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto Him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. You see that? Now, what I was trying to remember was the remedy for the beast overcoming God's saints. And there it is. Right in Revelation 17, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Put that in your mind. Quote, unquote, saints without the Lamb cannot overcome. Can't do it. There are church people right now all over the world who are so full of sin and wickedness. They can't stop. They have no power against their enemy. No power against the consequences of the law. No power against unrighteousness. The beast will overcome them every single time until the lamb steps in. A gentle lamb, a gentle little puppy lamb, a gentle little puppy lamb, little puppy, cute little puppy. They got new puppies this weekend. My wife and Matthew and did you get one, Courtney? Okay. Got new little puppies. And they're like little woolly lambs. We got the black sheep of the family. Okay. We did. It's what we ended up with. But anyway, I got to move on. I got so much to give here. But anyway, uh, what was I saying? These shall make more of the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. The little lamb overcomes the beast. Okay. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called... And chosen and what? You know what that means? Called means God elected you. Chosen means God elected you. Faithful means you stuck with it. Woo! I like it. So you see now, there's always been a battle going on in the Bible. A war against God, His Son, and His people. And it's real. It's real. Turn to Revelation 18. Well, you're already there. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Birds are images of spirits in the Bible. They're a picture of devils. That's what birds are. You remember um, the fowls of the air came down and devoured the seed up, the, the wayside seed? Then when Jesus teaches us the meaning of that parable, he said, Satan or the devil or that wicked one or whatever comes down. The Bible's telling you that when you see birds in the Bible, think spirits. The Holy Spirit came down like a... Okay? Well, I love it. So anyway, verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, the king of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. 
Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Let me tell you something. She is guilty of the murder of these people down in Texas. Again, I'm not asking what Bible they had. I, they're a Southern Baptist church, from what I gather. Usually, First Baptist means Southern Baptist. Okay? In just about every town, especially in the South. More than likely, a Southern Baptist church, a small church, about 50 people, half of their members are now dead. I just think that there's got to be some of those people that right now don't mind being dead. They're in heaven. Okay? They're in heaven. They, you've got to come out of Babylon. Picture Lot. Sodom is Babylon. Lot has to come out of Sodom. Then, Lot, do not be a partaker of her sins, and you will not be a partaker of her judgment. Okay? So that, that's what the Bible is showing us here. And then, I want you to look at, uh, let's see here, verse 12. Uh, let's back up to verse 11 so we get the context. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, uh, for no man buyeth her merchandise any more. She's a salesman. She's a trafficker. And all of the delicacies of the earth are in her hands. And people are getting bloody rich by her spirit. You show me the spirit of prosperity... And I'll show you that her name is Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, abomination of the earth. Every one of these stinking churches, that all that all that comes out of their mouth is wealth, 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 healing, wealth, wealth, wealth. The gospel was to make you rich. You're, if you're not rich, you don't have the gospel. That's a lie. That's from hell. And it comes right out of her, Mystery Babylon, the great. So here's what, here's what she's a merchant of. Here's what she's, what she's trading. Verse 11, or verse 12, the merchandise of gold and silver, and precious stones, and of pearls, and fine linen, and purple, and silk, and scarlet, and all thyene wood, and all manner vessels of ivory. Where does ivory come from? There's only one source. The elephant tusks. Okay? That is a big, that's a big deal now. In Africa, in Kenya, don't you kill them elephants without a license. Okay? Because what they'll do is they'll kill the elephant, or... They'll tranquilize the elephant, cut the horns off, cut the tusks off, and leave that elephant there by himself or whatever. And it's just wicked. But anyway, manner of vessels, precious wood, and a brass, iron, and marble. Verse 13. And cinnamon. Well, I like cinnamon on some things. And odors. And I like some odors. And ointments. And frankincense. And wine. And oil. And fine flour. And wheat. And beast. And sheep. And horses. And chariots. And slaves. And... Souls of men. You know what Peter said? Um, Peter said, I think it was in um, 2 Peter chapter 2. Um, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring destruction, bring upon themselves swift destruction. Many shall follow their, their pernicious ways by whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. The way of truth is the King James Bible. They speak evil of the King James Bible. In verse 3, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Your property. You're worth a lot. But you better be careful when a church tells you, Boy, you're very valuable to our church. There was a preacher told somebody I know who was thinking about leaving his church and he went up to her and he said you can't leave we need your tithes that was not a good selling point okay now turn to Genesis 4 Genesis 4 the first human death in the Bible. The first human death in history was a murder. Cold-blooded killing murder. Where can I put that on? I put it on here. 
Verse 1, Adam knew his wife, knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Where is it in this verse that says Satan conceived seed in her? It's not there, is it? So don't believe it. Don't, don't believe what's not in the Bible. Did I say that right? Believe what's in the Bible. But don't believe anything tell, somebody tells you that's not in the Bible. And she again bears brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now we have a problem here already. And, and here's how I look at it. God has already cursed the ground. He's cursed the ground and everything in it because it bears thorns and briars. Okay? So in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. God refused to accept Cain's offering. Now, it does not tell you right here in Genesis 4 why. But it does tell you later on that, number one, Cain did not believe what he was doing. He was, not, he was just performing the ritual, but not believing in what he was doing. That's one thing. Second thing is, we know that Cain was of that wicked one. Who's that? It's the devil. He was, he is a, here you have in Genesis, you have, a, you have the gospel story in Genesis 4. 4 is that number for the gospel. You have a gospel story here. You have Abel, who is, Bible calls him righteous Abel. And righteous Abel's sacrifices were accepted by God, but Cain's offering was rejected by God. Okay? You ha, and you have the story here now, of the jealousy of Cain over his own brother. Now think about it. Here's us puny humans. The Bible says in the Psalms that God made us, God made man a little lower than the angels. And yet, He's crowned us with everlasting life. He's given us His kingdom. Amen? He gave it to... That very thing that Satan wants... He's not going to get it because God's going to give it to us. American history is full. 20th and 21st century American history is full of a man killing another man because that man had his ex-girlfriend, now for his girlfriend, and he wanted that girlfriend back so he killed the other guy. Right? Happens all the... That happened in this county. A woman that I knew, I, I went to school with her. Her and her husband were working in the youth of this big church in this town. And, boy, it's going to take a little while, but anyway, i gotta, I got to tell you, this is how wicked this is. She was, this woman was out messing around with other men in that church. And she did not, she not, did not love her own husband. She did not want to divorce him. So she said, I'm going to have him killed. And one of the men that she was messing with, a member of that same church, she talked him into shooting her husband right off of um, Highway 61 down here that, because that's where he deer hunted. And she told her husband, or the, her boyfriend, her, her whoremonger, where he's going to be, what he's going to be driving, and the man actually got in a spot and practiced that shot. And sure enough, this man, deer season, drives down this little back way down in the woods, and as he's driving real slow as to not spook the deer, that guy popped him right in the head, killed him. And he confessed and said, she put me up to it. He's still in jail. She got out a couple years ago. She did prison. But she got out. She, that is mystery Babylon. That is, she, she kills innocent people. And she's a whore. And that's who she was. Okay? So, watch this now. Abel, verse 4. Oh, we already read that. Uh, verse 6. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? 
And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Cain is the devil. He is Satan. Abel is Christ in this picture. Christ is the innocent one whose sacrifice is accepted by God. Because God won't take the blood of bulls and goats, not for, not for eternal forgiveness and salvation. The blood of bulls and goats cannot save eternally. Christ's blood offered one time saves all men with all sins if they believe. Amen? So here's Abel, and Abel is killed. Now watch this now. Christ is the Son of God. Christ is going to receive the inheritance given to Him by His Father. Amen? We are joint heirs with Christ. Amen? So that what He gets, we get. When He comes back to rule and reign for a thousand years, who's He bringing in the truck with Him? Us! And it's a powerful truck. You wouldn't believe the amount of horsepower that thing has. Amen? Obviously not a Chrysler, all right? So anyway, <laughs> that was mean. Yeah. So anyway, he slew him, innocent. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? Now I'm listening to this. Verse, verse 10, look at this. And the voice of thy brother's what? Crieth unto me from the ground. And look at verse 11. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Do you see what the earth just did, Megan? What did the earth do? And drank the blood of the innocent man of God. She drank the blood of the saints. She's blood thirsty. She builds abortion clinics. She is responsible for communism. Communism, they said this is like the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, 1917, where the communists and the workers overtook the Tsar of Russia, had him killed, his whole family killed, and these evil Karl Marx, Lenin, Stalin, that kind of mess, Khrushchev, these guys, they said that communism in the hundred years that has been alive on this earth has killed over 65 million people. China, Cuba, North Korea, Russia. Where else is communism? Uh, Vietnam, the killing fields of Cambodia by communist dictators, killing innocent people, killing innocent children. That is innocent blood, and whoever's part of that is a partaker of that blood. They've got blood on their hands. You believe that? I sure do. Can they be forgiven? Yes. God forgives. They killed His own only begotten Son. And what did, what did Jesus say just before He died? Father, forgive them. Okay? Well, that's sweet, amen? That's sweet. But here you have, here you have a picture of Babylon and her bloodthirstiness Receiving, once she got a taste of it, Genesis 4 was her first taste of the blood of the saints. And she liked it. And she decided, I'm going to do, have to do this again. Turn to um, Exodus. Um... Exodus, I'm going to say Exodus 2. This kind of just popped in my mind here. Or Exodus 1. Verse 15. Well, let's back up just a little bit. Verse um, 10. The counselors of, uh, of Pharaoh said, verse 10, Come on, let us, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. Talking about the Jews. 
And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. You know what? This fellow was right. Israel was going to be a threat. If any nation went to war against Egypt, the fear was that Israel would join their side and they'd be slaughtered. So militarily, they're, they're going to do this. They're going to try to kill the Jews. Get rid they need them as slaves, but they're going to try to kill as many of them as possible because the Jews were outdoing the Egyptians in childbirth. The Jews did not go to the abortion clinic. Okay? The Egyptians did. So anyway, uh, they afflicted him more and more, but anyway, that didn't work. So verse 15, the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra, and the, other, and the name of the other Pua. And I wanted to name one of our girls Pua. Lisa wouldn't let me. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, that means they're giving birth. Okay? They're on the stools, they're giving birth. If it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter... Then she shall live. Why a son? Why a son? Think Bible. Huh? Bloodline? The name? This is a prototype. This is a foreshadow of the coming of Christ. Because in this, you have the coming of the Savior who's going to lead God's people out of slavery, out of bondage. Just like Christ led us out of Egypt. Amen. So they're trying to kill Moses, the Savior, and the devil doesn't know who Moses is going to be yet. So his idea is, let's kill all the boy babies of the Jews, and we got them. We'll put a stop to this nonsense. I'm telling you, the devil, I think he senses things. Okay? Who was it? Was it you that asked me, does God know everything? Yes, God knows everything. Does the devil know everything? No. But he's a beast. And beasts have the ability to sense things that you and I don't get. Beasts can smell. Beasts can see things. They can sense things. Their spider senses are tingling. Okay? They can, they can, I think the devil knows when a savior is about to come on the scene. Because if this story is matched by what we see in, in Matthew chapter 1. And I think Luke chapter 2, where Herod says, uh, Show me, where is he that to be born king of the Jews so that I can go and worship him? He didn't want to worship him, he wanted to kill him. And since the wise men would not turn him in, they would not do that. Herod sent for the slaughter of every male child under the age of two years old. All throughout, it was, it was Rachel crying for her children. That's what Jeremiah prophesied it to be. The murder of innocent people. Who would be God's people? Don't you ever forget that. As long as you remain a child of the living God, you are a threat to Satan and what he wants done. And, and I like being a threat, amen? Turn to 1 Kings 21. 1 Kings 21. Now, don't get, don't get anxious. I'm, I am getting close to being done. Okay? I, I'm, I just literally, this, when I read this thing, boy, I mean, it got me. That could have been our church. How many's here tonight? Six, seven, eight, 29, 30, 30 people. Three of us walk out, 27 don't. That could have been us. Amen? Okay? I mean, we have, a, we have a plan. We have a plan. We've got cameras that are being watched. We've got doorways that are locked. We've got a doorway that's open, and it's, there's eyeballs on it right now. Okay? And we've got people who carry weapons in this church who are sitting with their weapon right now. And I know of churches that won't do that. That's a mistake. I'm not saying everybody has to come in going, Wee-haw! Let's have church! Woo! Okay? I'm not saying that. I'm saying it doesn't make sense to leave your people in danger. 
Jesus himself said, if the good man of the house would have known at what hour the thief would come, would he not be watching? If he's not watching, the thief will come in and break up and destroy and kill. Jesus said of the Pharisees and the, Sa and the Sadducees and the scribes, he said, you're of your father the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. And you're his children. And in 1 Kings 21, we have um, Nabal's vineyard. In verse 5, Ahab wanted Nabal's, Nabal's, Nabal's vineyard. Nabal and Naboth. It's Naboth. Naboth had a vineyard given to him by his father. The law required that Naboth hang on to that vineyard and pass it down to his son. Now you think about this. There's a story, a parable in your Bible of a man who owned the, the fields and he had harvesters out there laboring and he sent a messenger. They killed him. He sent another messenger. They killed him. And the man said, I'll send my only son. Surely they won't kill him. And when they saw him, they said, let's kill the king's son. That way we can have this for our own. Now we know the, now we know the motive, don't we? The devil wants to sit in the seat of the Most High God, which I believe is in this church. We worship the Most High God. It's not a boast, not a brag, but I'm confident. Okay? And the devil wants this church anyway. Wouldn't surprise me if that church folded up. But then again, it wouldn't surprise me if they had 300 people next Sunday. I hope they do, and I hope the pastor loses every Bible he's got except that old King James. So anyway, Jezebel, Ahab wants Naboth's vineyard. Naboth cannot give it to him by law. So Ahab is pouting. Got his lip pooched out. Got his blankie, his ginky, holding on to it. Verse 5, Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money. Or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. You see it? It's all about gaining control of the inheritance. Let's destroy the son and all the church members, and then we will then own that place. We will sit where God sits. So... Let me skip on down here. Verse 10. Two men, sons of Belial, before, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him, that he may die. And that is exactly what happened. Verse 13. There came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. The men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth in the presence of the people. I can holler louder than you can, son. Amen. That got his attention. Naboth in the presence of the people say, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with the stones that he died. His blood was spilled on the ground. How do we know? Because Elijah the prophet came and said, listen to me. In the very place that Naboth's blood was spilled on the ground, the dogs are going to lap your blood up. And that is exactly what happened. God got his vengeance. Amen. God got, by the way, the shooter's dead. God got his vengeance. Yeah, shooter's dead. Okay? And number two, don't pay attention to these freaks on YouTube saying that was a staged event. It didn't really happen. That was fake Hollywood blood. Those are crisis act. Don't believe that nonsense. Now, 1 Samuel 13. I'm almost done. You get the gist of it. Here's the gist of it. God's children are at risk. God's children are at risk. Remember I said to you this morning, who's willing to fight, make war against the beast? Okay? I wanted to serve in the military. In high school, I wanted to serve in the military. 
I wanted to be in the Navy, wanted to ride them boats around. <laughs> Submarines are called boats by their captains. Gun boat. I had a guy say that they, they would have put me on a ship called an LST. Large stationary target. <laughs> Practice. That's where they would have put me. They, they figured if he's going to tear the boat up, we might as well help him out. Amen? That's me. That's my nature. But God wouldn't let me. God would not let me. I was told by a recruiter, because I was, I was good at band music, that I could join the Marine. You don't see me as a Marine. Okay, I could join the Marine Corps and get in that Marine band. And I went, wow, me? I was told that. And God said, no, you're preaching, Mike. Remember, I have a greater thing for you. Okay, I have a greater thing for you. The army of God. But I don't know what it's like to carry a gun out into a battlefield. But I do know how to carry a sword into one. I do not know what it's like to think that when they open the end, when they open up the gate of that floating tank and you step out at Omaha Beach, I don't know what that's like. But our uncles and grandfathers knew it because they lived through it. Okay? So, 1 Samuel 13. Hunter... I love you. You need to sit down by your mama. Look at him. Uh, look, uh, I, but he looks so much like me, it makes me sick. Now look at this. Verse 19. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this and I'm going to be done. There was Verse 19 of 1 Samuel 13. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. Metal smith. Blacksmith. Okay? For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. You, God has given you weapons of warfare. They are a bended knee. They are an authorized Bible. A, a sharper than any two-edged sword Bible. I saw an electron microscope picture a razor blade. Did you know that it is not perfectly pointed at the end? It's rounded on that razor's edge, but it's so small that it cuts through skin. The Bible is sharper than that. The Word of God is sharper than that. Amen? They do not want them bearing swords and spears. Verse 20, but all the Israelites went down to who? Who did they go to? The stupid Philistines. Listen. That is the church trying to get the world to do what God should be doing for us. Let's not ask the government for funds to run our church. Let's not participate. Let's not do that. Because if God's in it, He writes all the checks. Okay? So anyway, so uh, they all had to go down. Where was I going with this? Yeah, here's, here it is. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. Count those. How many? That's our gospel, people. This, this sword is the gospel. What do you think the Philistines are going to do when they get our sword in their hands. They're not going to sharpen it. They're going to dull it. They're going to file it down so that it's not a threat to them. That's what you got. And all these new Bibles. One, two, three, four. There it is, right in front of you. They had to sharpen every man his share, his culture, his axe, and his mattock. Four things. Verse 21, yet they had a file for the mattocks and for coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. Who was it, that guy that's in uh, Judges chapter 3, 
where the, the Savior that rose up, the judge that rose up, killed 500, 800 men, something like that, 600 men, with an ox goad. Okay? That's a long, sharp stick to poke ox to get them to move. Okay? Verse 22. Now, this is it right here. So it came to pass in the day of battle. Who's ready to go to battle? Who's ready to go to battle? You're not if you leave your sword, your shield, your helmet, your gird, your shoes, and your breastplate. You're not ready. You'll lose. You'll die in battle. They'll kill you. And that's the goal of gun control. Gun control to me is as much a spiritual issue as it is a physical one. Because weapons are the only thing that we have to defend ourselves. Evil people will not go away when they take our guns. Evil people will prevail when they take our guns. The same issue is this Bible. Evil will not go away if we close the Bible and stop using its words to offend people. They will only wax worse and worse and infect everybody around them. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan, his son was there found. The government has a weapon. How come the people can't have a weapon? Why is it that the government wants to know everything that we're doing and yet will not give us access to even a third of what they're doing? It is control. Why is it that the seminaries and the Bible colleges and the pastors that come out of them have the mindset, we are the bearers of the sword? You poor, pathetic Pew people, that's four P's by the way, poor pathetic pew people, one-eyed, one horn, blind purple people, anyway, the people are not allowed to carry a weapon. The church members are told, you can't understand the Bible like I do. I know the secret teachings, and I and only I can give you the real meaning of God's word. And if you don't get it from me, you won't get it. That is exactly what Mike Hoggard used to think. Word for word. And God got me over it. Um, your, your dad was instrumental in my life because, I mean, I, I knew him growing up here. I loved him to death. And then he called me, and him and, uh, who was the preacher down there in uh, Licking? No, before him. Anyway, I knew this, I know this guy for life, I forgot his name. They called me for a revival. So I went down there to preach a revival. And I taught like 1 Samuel 17. And I was writing stuff up, up on the board, and I was having the people give me issues of life that were pertaining to that, that deal. And I didn't know this church. I didn't know how they handled the Bible issue. And it was, it was Warren Livingston. It was your dad that said out loud, he gets at us by dumbing down these new versions of the Bible. And I went, Woo! Thank you, Brother Warren Livingston. You opened the door and I'm going to walk in it. Okay? And God opened the door there to show people. And I wasn't mean about it at all. To show people that these new Bibles, and your dad knows it, these new Bibles... Because he ran the bookstore. And he knew what was in them. And these new Bibles are dull, not sharp, and not a threat to Satan. This one is. This is why he wants it gone. He wants this Bible gone. Because this is the only thing that can bring him down. That can send him walking. And get him out of your path. It is the only thing that will. Jesus did it. He used the word of God to do it. Okay? This is why they don't want you to have a Bible. 
They don't want you to read a Bible. They don't want you to bring a Bible of any translation into the church because they're not going to use your translation that week. They're going to use four others. And so you have no idea what verse to bring. So you either bring a whole stack of them or you just leave it sitting there and just trust what he's got on the screen. I'm telling you, that's a danger. That is a threat to Christianity. And if the devil cannot destroy this Bible that way, we're next. Because God has entrusted its safety and its preservation into our hands. He has taken this book and put it in earthen vessels that it may remain. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Okay? I do not know. I've not heard yet whether this church... I mean, it's Texas. You figure in Texas, they come with a semi-automatic rifle hung over their shoulder going to church. But from what I... Just from what little bit I know, it doesn't look like anybody fired back. Even while he stopped. I do not want that to happen here. That pastor now has to come back from where he is and deal with the loss of his church and his 14-year-old daughter. And I'm going to pray for that man because I would not want to be in his shoes. Okay? People, it's getting dangerous out there. Arm yourselves. At least shield yourselves. This is the shield of faith. Okay? And pray for the men that carry in this church. Pray for that the doors are watched. We, want, we don't want to lock the door keep people out. That's contradictory to why we're here. We want to leave the door open. But my goodness, nowadays, somebody's got to watch the door. We need watchmen on the wall to sound the trumpet and the alarm in case something happens. And let's pray that it never does. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Appreciate you coming. Appreciate you being here tonight. What I'm telling you is, Babylon is bloodthirsty. She, she likes being drunk, and the only thing that makes her high is the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs. That would be us. The question is, are you willing to lose your head for the cause of Jesus Christ. I'm not asking you to answer that now. What I'm asking you is, what I'm telling you is, that tonight you get the opportunity to ask God, God, I don't know that I could right now. Everything that's in me, God, tells me to protect my own life. But Father, I trust you that in such a day I will rise up and stand for Jesus Christ and not bow to the King's image. I know that I could be thrown in the furnace of fire. And God, I believe you will protect me there, but even if you don't, God, I will still stand when others fall. Now's your opportunity to pray that while it's safe. Because you may not get the opportunity to pray it if it happens. Heavenly Father, I'm more than likely the biggest scaredy cat in this whole place. God, you know what I go through when I go to Kenya. You know, Father, what I go through days like today when the devil just kicks me around and tosses me about tries to scare me, tries to put fear in my heart. He does a pretty good job of it. So, Father, I would not ever for a minute say openly that I know for a fact that I'll stand on that day if it was left up to my flesh. And so, Father, me and you have had this talk before. And you know where my heart is. If you called upon me to die for your kingdom. 
then give me the grace to do it or I won't be able to. So, Father, we ask you, Lord, to protect us here physically and spiritually. Father, as we have men watching cameras and doors right now, God, would you give us men who will watch for the spiritual battles that are coming and sound the alarm that this church is protected. These little lambs cannot protect themselves. They need shepherds. They need watchmen. They need people, Lord, who will stand and shield. People who will fight back physically and spiritually. And Father, just as Trish this morning drew her line, stood her ground, and refused to send her father to hell by letting him die. She stood her ground against the devil, even against those doctors, and against hell itself. She stood to defend her own daddy. And Lord, I'm just rejoicing at what she told me today. This man, in my opinion, Lord, has been looking for real love all his life. And I believe now, Lord, he's found it in you. Father, watch over him, protect him, give him his, his legs, his strength back. And Lord, help him, dear God, to fulfill the desire of his heart when he found out that God's people had prayed for him. His first desire was to come and be in the house of the Lord to sing your praises. Father, I'll wait for you to do that with him. So, Father, we need, we need people, we need men, we need women who will stand spiritually and fight off the devils and shield and protect and not accept that defeat is imminent. So, Father, raise people like that up in this church. These people that are watching online, raise men and women and even children up, Lord, who will stand guard, stand and watch, ready, ready to defend the home, ready to defend the land at any cost. Because the devils are out there, Babylon is out there, and she's looking for the next victim to drink their righteous blood. And Father, Lord, bless that church. Bless First Baptist Church, Sutherland Springs, Texas. God, they need your help. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help them. We wish that upon them, Lord, because if it was us, we would want that for ourselves. So, Lord, teach us to love our neighbors and defend them as well and to love them like we love ourselves. Father, bless your word, bless this book, bless these people tonight. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.